administrators, maintenance, and management as well. So anyone who has some interaction with pressure relief, we believe needs some form of training on the basics. So um, today we're going to be looking at a case study, the Faison disaster. So this disaster happened in 1966, so it's uh, almost a 50-year-old 50, 50 um, event, and it's a bit of a game changer. So the reason we're looking at it is this is the type of event that is ch has um, changed legislation. So um, significant amount of people were injured or killed. So 18 people were killed um, and a further 81 injured and it caused extensive da damage. So this type of incident leads to changes in standards and is one of the stepping stones to how we get to the standards today. So now this presentation is going to focus not on everything that went wrong in this disaster but what went wrong or what was the understanding around pressure relief during this disaster and then how the, the, the new standards are trying to guide us away from that. So the initial incident occurred because um, three people went out to do some sampling from a pressurised propane sphere. Uh, unfortunately the operator was burned and therefore unable to seal up the sampling line and this leaked and continued to leak which led to a fire so um, there was the initial fire and it was on um, sphere 443 this sphere levied so it exploded um, and then this had a domino effect so once that sphere exploded, exploded it led to um, significant amounts of destruction and then other tanks exploding so you can see here some pictures of the fire as it's occurring and on the right you can see the crater where the initial sphere was. Um, some other things to note is that the other two tanks or two of the other spheres have collapsed so they've fallen off their supports and then they have exploded and it's also about 1.2 meters from the, the, bun, the bottom of the bun to the, to the, um, to the sphere. So. So what actually happened? So the initial three, oh, the initial sampling was at six o'clock. So they went out to the tank at about six o'clock, and they had the the, the leak. The initial fire didn't start till approximately 7:20 a.m. So that's when the refinery alarm sounded, fire alarm sounded, and there was firefighting efforts at that time to try and put the tank um, out. Unfortunately, uh, they were nearly successful, but not quite. So the fire continued to, to rage and um, continued on. At 7.45 the relief valve operated, so 25 minutes later, it took 25 minutes for the vessel to heat up to the point where the pressure rose to its, above its design pressure and the relief valve opened. So reasons it would have taken that long is it was a significantly sized vessel, um, it was insulated, so it had insulation and it also had water spray on it. Um, to note in regards to the water spray that the water spray for this tank turned on but the water spray for the whole area turned on and there was insufficient sufficient water to feed the whole system so it wasn't at its full supply to this tank. So interesting to note there. Um, so relief valve opened at 7.45 so 25 minutes to heat up, relief valve opening most likely opening, closing, opening, closing, opening, closing, um, as it contained the pressure. Pressure maintained at 110% um, as, as given by the European codes. Um, at 8.30 they connected to the, to the local canal. So at this time they, they gained more water to try and fight this fire. There was approximately an extra 15 hoses brought in to, to hose the area and the water water supply was uh, more fully engaged. Now what's really interesting about about this is those hoses were not directed towards the actual sphere that was on fire. The understanding from um, the operational personnel at the time now, alright given duress there's a fire and there's a lot going on, but the understanding was that, this, that the system had a relief valve, the relief valve was functional or was operating, it had a water spray system, it was insulated, so yes it's on fire but it was stable. Um, 
and so they directed their water spray towards the other tanks. So not much water went onto this tank. A further 10 minutes after this, at 8.40, the sphere suddenly ruptured, so it, it levied, and I believe it was because the area that the unwetted surface area, so if I just try and highlight this, um, became overheated and failed at below its design pressure. So the unheated area here um, had been exposed to the fire at this time for an hour and 20 minutes and it weakened to the point where it failed below its design pressure. So the, the, the pressure relief was working, water spray was working, insulation was working, the fire was just, it, 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 it had weakened the unwetted area and therefore caused a rupture. And once it ruptured, um, it was a massive explosion, so a blevy, and at, this is the time where the 18 people were killed and a further eight, uh, 81 injured. Um, from here, so from when the tank um, levied, there was uh, no more firefighting efforts for about eight more hours. So for, they stepped back and just let the fire burn itself out. So it, that actually led to more explosions and more damage. So if you take a look at the area map, you can see the vessels in, in dark grey that have been destroyed and the light grey where there's been damage. And, and you can see at the Faison village, 400 metres away, there was damage there from flying um, debris. So, as I said, this is a game-changing incident, it, and legislation now is trying to guide us away from what actually happened there. So, and how are they doing this? So, when you look at legislation now, one of the main things you find, find fire, or the main things you find, are sloped ground. So if you've got sloped ground, it it can uh, it takes the fire away. So there's no build up of storage underneath your tank. So sloped ground, we actually reduces the heat um, of of the fire into your vessel by 40%. So it, it's quite a lot of heat removed, and it's just because the fire is running off. Water spray. Water spray is very interesting. So in the current Standards, you can't take any um, any credit for a water spray system when sizing your pressure relief. The reason for this is that it's an activated system, so a number of things have to work for your water spray to work correctly. And the phase and disaster was a good example of that, where there wasn't enough water. So, for a water spray system, you need enough water. You need your pump to work you need your um, valves to work, you need your sensor to work, and any any one of these could have failed at any time and you wouldn't know, so you're not allowed to take credit for that when sizing your pressure relief. Now, personally, when I first started sizing pressure relief, I thought, why would you have a water spray system if you can't take any credit for that? It's only subsequently when I've actually seen these systems work, so I saw them work in the paper industry, Obviously, there's paper, large risk of fire. You see these systems work, and you go, oh my god, there's so much water in such a short amount of time. So if you're fighting a fire, having a water spray system there is a de <laughs> definite benefit. Insulation. So you can reduce, considerably reduce the heat load into your vessel by insulation. So um, the, the guys go through different levels of insulation by how much you can reduce the um, heat input but it's significant. Um, one thing noted in the case study for Faison was that the, although the supports for the vessel were fireproof, they weren't fireproof to the same degree as the tank. Uh, and you could see there was a number of toppled tanks due to, due to, um, due to that. Um, pressure relief, as we've discussed, but um, you need to note the pressure relief system during a fire is, main, is, is stopping your tank from exploding but it doesn't necessarily mean that your system is stable. So you need to take that into account. Everyone needs to understand that. It, it's giving you time to evacuate the area, to create a safe space, and to fight the fire, if possible. Depressurization um, was recommended and works very differently to pressure relief. So pressure relief is trying to keep that vessel um, at 110% of its design pressure. Um, depressurization is actually trying to reduce it. So depressurization is looking at, okay, 
let's reduce the pressure below its design pressure so that if the unwetted area gets overheated it won't it still won't fail so it's once again buying you more time and removing the contents as well so the the final explosion won't be as high <clears throat> so takeaway points I mean the major takeaway point here is that during uh, a fire pressure relief is buying your time pressure relief systems are buying your time and it's very important for people to understand that so they should understand the basic concepts of pressure relief why is it there how does it function what is it protecting and during a fire it's buying me time it's letting me get remove my personnel create a safe space and fight the fire um, legislation has evolved from these game changing incidents and I think it's very important for young engineers to understand the case studies um, so that when they're looking at the legislation they can say okay I can reduce the fire by 40% do I want to or do I not well the reason I want to is because in these prior studies they they've recommended it um, to stop the blevy so thank you very much for your time um, if you would like to learn more about the um, PSV training courses so our next training course is a process critical safety systems training course uh, centered around pressure relief so it's a two-day course around pressure relief it's running in Melbourne Victoria Australia on the 28th and 29th of October um, there's a link there so www.processsafetyverification.com um, or if you want to send me an email or you want a copy of the slides there's my email address at the bottom so thank you very much for your time and I hope you, you like that